Hi, uh, so I'm Jamie Manning. I'm a CPU design engineer and I've been working on our MMU. So you need an MMU for all application class cores because it takes virtual addresses and translates them into physical addresses. So we'll be getting virtual addresses from the IFU and the DCU, so uh, instructions and data requests that need to be translated. First things first, they'll come into the MMU and then we will look up our TLB to see if we um, have seen this request before and if we can hit in the TLB. If we can, then we will return the translation back to the IFU or the DCU, whoever re requested it. But if it misses and we don't have it in the TLB, then we need to send the requests over to our page table walker to do the page table walk. And so how RISC-V is designed is that page table walks are an iterative process where you take part of the request and you send it off to the memory. So we actually send this back to the DCU. We send it back to the DCU and the DCU will then go and fetch from memory whatever the uh, next step of the page table walker is. And then we iterate through and we step through the various uh, levels of the page table to walk through and then eventually get a request. When we have a request, we can um, do two things. Firstly, return it to the IFU or the DCU. And we will also put it into the page table walker so the next time, if they need to request it again, we'll have that. So why do you have virtual memory? Well, three fundamental reasons. The first one, which is not so important these days, is not enough RAM. So if you don't have physically enough RAM in your machine. The other one is holes and fragmentation of the address space. And then finally, you have programs that can interfere with each other. So the first problem of not enough memory is you can see, imagine this is a, a program which expects to have four gigabytes of memory, but you only have one gigabyte of RAM installed. What happens, it's fine if you're accessing addresses it within this region because they can map directly to your RAM, but what happens when you go outside of that region and there's no RAM? So it would cause a problem. So that's one of the things that virtual memory will solve. So we have the other problem, which is holes in memory. So imagine we've got a four gigabyte ad address space and you've got program one, which takes up one gigabyte of memory. and You've got program two that takes up two gigabytes of memory. You want to kick off program one out and put it onto disk. So now you have one gigabyte above and one gigabyte below. And the program that you wanted to load in, it's two gigabytes. Well, there's not two con consecutive gigabytes of memory. So you can't have both programs in. So you've got holes above and below in your mem memory space, which virtual memory will solve. So the third and final problem that virtual memory solves is in this scenario, program one, say, stores this address. Then you also have program two runs, and it also wants to store something to this address. It will overwrite what program one stored in that address so that if program one then tried to read it back, it would see it being corrupted by program two. So you have both of these programs accessing the same memory uh, region when they're not supposed to. So virtual memory will give each program the illusion of the whole region of memory to itself and it will provide translations such that they don't interfere and overwrite their own, their, each one's data in memory. So in RISC-V, we have four different virtual memory schemes. There's SV32, which is for XLEN32 machines, and then there's SV39, 48, and 57 for XLEN64 machines. Uh, today, we'll just look at SV39. So when there is a, a the virtual address which comes from the IFU or the DCU, like, then it will come like this, and that means there's 39 bits of virtual address. Within the MMU, when we, well, within the page table walker, whenever we're doing a translation, what we can do is we can take a PPN, which stands for physical page number, from the CSR unit, which will point to the root of the page table in memory. We take that number and we take the top nine bits of the virtual address, add it together, and then we'll have a physical address, which we can then send to memory to retrieve a page table entry. This page table entry will come back and it will look more or less like this, uh, slightly simplified. But the important bit is there's some information bits in the page table walker saying if it's valid, if it's a leaf page or non-leaf page, what are the permissions like uh, read, write, or execute. And it also has this PPN information here as well. If it's a leaf page, what we know then is it's a one gigabyte page. 
So once we have the page table entry returned, we can find out what the final physical address is to return to the IFU or the DCU by taking the 26 bits here from the page table entry and concatenating it with the virtual address here to get a 56-bit wide uh, physical address, which then can be returned and used to the tra for translation. However, if it's a non-leaf page, then we go to the next iterative step of the page table walk, which means taking uh, the full PPM that was stored in the uh, page table entry, and then this effectively replaces this part now. So you take that and you go to the next bit and you add the next nine bits of the address to the PPM that you found in memory. And from there, you have another physical address and you can go request that from memory and it will come back with another page table entry. And we can repeat the same process and find out is it a two megabyte page or is it a non-leaf page? And if it's a non-leaf page, we go to the next step. And then we can finally arrive at a four kilobyte page. So that's how you do a page day walk.